Hello and welcome along to the Panto Podcast. This week my guest is the hilarious Johnny Casson. He tells me all about how he keeps his act clean, working with the Beatles, and how he loved playing Dame. So please, sit back and enjoy the latest Panto Podcast. My guest for today's Panto Podcast is legendary funny man Johnny Casson. Hello Johnny. How are you? I'm great. You? How are you? You're, you're in the in the pot at the moment. Yeah. Yeah, it's the only time I've been on pot. <laughs> yeah. but, uh, it's, it's, it's good getting old. You've got loads of things to look forward to. <laughs> Pots on your legs. How did you do it? My knee gave way. My knee just gave way. And I fell to the floor. But I kind of twisted on the way down and... Uh, I broke my ankle and it was a, had an operation on it and they've um, 12 days in hospital. No bar, no alcohol. <laughs> and a big pot on my leg. Can I go to the toilet please? Yeah, we'll get you a... Uh, we'll, what do they get me? What do they call it? Commode. A commode. Oh, dear me. <laughs> Very embarrassing. Uh, but it worked. I bet you've stayed in worse places though, when you've been gigging. Oh, just a bit, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I had some, some good old digs in, in the olden days. But <laughs> so how did it all begin for you then? I mean, were, were you a funny, funny little boy? Uh, uh, yeah, I was always a bit of a... I, I was only little and a bit... I wasn't cheeky, but I just had a, like, a baby face. and uh, uh, I, was, I, I was never shy. And I was never frightened of speaking, so if anybody, if anything needed to be said, I was like a spokesperson. We had a, it was a Catholic grammar school I went to, and one, one when a, a, a cardinal came, and it was all boys, and he addressed the, uh, the great unwashed, the whole school, and then they did a questions and answers thing. Anybody got any? Well, I they prime me to ask a question, and uh, they just discovered what they said was the um, uh, the skeleton of uh, Noah's Ark, and they found it on uh, halfway up a mountain in Turkey, uh, and they reckon it was the, the skeleton of Noah's Ark in this fossilized thing, and uh, the. The religious people convinced it was, you know, that it uh, tested for its age and that, and it, it linked in. And they asked if anybody got any questions. So I, said, so I, I just mentioned it, because it was a news item, this. And I said, that recently I, I saw they found, they found what they think is the fossil of Noah's Ark in Turkey, fossilised in a mountain. I said, uh, and we were led to believe the animals went in two by two. So how did they find two penguins and two polar bears in Turkey? <laughs> and the headmaster, who I was doing it, said, uh, no, 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 we don't want silly questions like that. We want serious questions, please, sit down. Not really. I couldn't answer it, though. <laughs> <laughs> was it a funny household growing up? Yeah, it was, because my, my dad was... Uh, a musician playing dance bands and uh, so there were almost mu musicians in the house and there were gags going off all the time you know any, any of his pals that came they'd be telling jokes and he used to sit there and, uh, and it was the first time I'd heard swearing and uh, as, a, as a little boy he was like Whoa. he used to make me laugh he, 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 real, real swear words you know because they were musos and I, th I can remember thinking I'm going to do. I'm going to join the band when I grow up, if that's what goes on. <laughs> <laughs> and I did do. I, my, my dad wanted me to play trombone, and I couldn't. <clears throat> it's quite a wheelie instrument, with me only being a little fella. I couldn't really hold it straight anyway. So uh, I didn't. I didn't fancy playing anything else except drums. So I started taking drum lessons, and uh, and that was it. I got hooked on that, and. I've been in debt ever since. <laughs> but great, great being a drum, but great being in a band. 
know, because you, you, you're invincible when you're in a group. Hmm. You're shielded. You know, we can get through anything. And we did do it. What sort of stuff were you playing then? Put, basically, pop music, 50s and 60s. But we were young men in the 60s, so we we easily assimilated into the, uh, the 60s scene. And we ended up working with the Beatles. People like that worked with everybody. And uh, back in, you know, back in people and uh, back to all. Gary, Gary Glitter, played drum for him. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I met him all. Hilton Johnny was good, he was, he was playing with, um, I don't know what they call him, a Long John Baldry, they call him, he had a, he had a couple of hit records. And Elton was playing uh, piano in his thing. He was a nice fella. <coughs> he looked around a lot and became big stars, these lads. And then what made you then want to sort of introduce the comedy? Uh, we were always, we, we were a show group. We did, we actually did uh, dance routines, and the comical ones. And uh, uh, the singer that we had was one of the best singers of any, any group in the 60s. He was called Malcolm Clark. He was from Bradford. Beautiful voice he had. He sang, sang like Orbison. And uh, we did good pop music. Uh, and then Malcolm, and uh, he, he got, uh, he was only 25, he got cancer. And uh, he was dead within 12 months. So we lost one of the, the chief components of the group. To, to, rather than replacing which we couldn't do we decided to do a comedy because the theatre clubs were opening then big big theatre clubs and I took it but really easy I just took to it because I, I couldn't fail because I got children by now so I didn't wait to succeed with the group so um, it came quite easily to me and uh, so I, 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 I had no I had no fear of failure I couldn't afford to fail and uh, I used the two boys in the group with the, they were good props they were both comical looking and uh, uh, one was really thin and uh, he was a guitar player he was called Richard Harding phenomenal phenomenal guitar player um, and we used to do universities and all that and I've seen people open mouth at this guitar player he played finger style like Chet Atkins, country style. And I've seen people open mouthed watching him play in front of the stage. Like people like Eric Clapton shaking his head. He mesmerised them. And uh, he got offers to play with Tom Jones and everybody, but he liked his group, he wouldn't leave the group. So it's funny how your life pads out like that, you know. And, uh, what I play So what made you want to go solo? Well, uh, it wasn't my idea. They were, I think they wanted to earn... Uh, Richard got married. And uh, that oh, alters your uh, lifestyle a bit. And uh, she was a girl singer. And she was very good. She was a local girl where I lived in Halifax. And uh, she'd worked, worked to talk of the town in London. She was a good singer. And... Uh, I think they wanted a different lifestyle, which meant Richard staying at home more because he had a recording studio and not being on the road as much, and they could earn more money. So I decided to end the group. And I finished on the Friday night, and I started working on my own on Saturday, which was some culture shock, to do two 45 minutes on your own, as opposed to doing... 10 minutes here, 10 minutes there and sitting back on the drums, getting, getting off to go for a wee. I miss that, because you can't get off once you're on, you have to stay. And uh, I took to it quite easily, the comedy thing, and and within a few months I was earning as much on my own as I did with a three-piece group. And, um, just, you just try and progress from there. They had a system in, in those days. You, you served your apprenticeship, if you like. You learned your trade, and uh, you got better and better. And uh, eventually, 
uh, you could you get you know if you did it did it, you get on telly and then you'd be invited to do stuff like a real variety show which is like a reward and now uh, all that went television just they put people in there uh, and they become stars and then they've got to learn the trade they learn the business after reaching stardom the wrong way around and uh, it, it happens today in, uh, in your talent programs and that you know and uh, talent show winners and uh, you know you, you work with people and I, I worked with a fellow called Dickie Valentine who was a big star in the 50s. He sang with the big bands and that, and he had a few hit records. <coughs> Excuse me. And he uh, he said to me, best advice I ever had, he said, you're a funny lad, you. I see you working on your own. And I said, no, I'm a drummer, I want to be a music. I'm a comic, you know. No, I can see you working on your own. He said, uh, the best advice I can give you, John, he said, is uh, work clean. Because I was a club comedian, uh, probably a bit bluer than uh, a theatre comedy. Anyway, I did it with the best advice I ever got. Because if you have to work blue, you can rough it up. But if you're a blue comic, you can't smooth it down. Mm. And it was a really good advice, looking back. What kind of jokes were you telling then at the beginning? I did, I, I, I always did, uh, I always did sort of granddad jokes and uh, you know family jokes like stuff people can relate to because like you know everybody had granddads and that and uh, um, mine were uh, Yorkshire and stoic and uh, uh, practical you know I can remember my granddad said to me now look after the pennies pennies will become pounds he said and look after the pound save your money don't fritter it away he said, money don't, money don't grow on trees, lad. So I said, why do banks have so many branches then? <laughs> and he, he hit me with his cap right on top of head. But um, it was like that, you know, they, had, they were d different lives. And uh, I used to do this routine. I said, used to... As I got older and uh, my grandparents were getting older, I used to go and see them whenever I could. And they lived in a little, you know, little white cottage. And uh, you'd go in the cottage and there'd be my white-haired granny sat with a white-haired cat on her lap. My white-haired granddad, he was sat with a, a white-coloured Yorkshire terrier on his lap. I said they used to live next to a flour mill. And uh, nobody used to get it at first. <laughs> <laughs> but, 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 you know, they were just soft routines, mm. but just about that life. Always with a dash of naughtiness to it yeah. as well. Yeah, I, well, I, I found that I, I, I was able to deliver uh, adult material uh, without swearing. Because mm. I'd, I'd go out and do sports and dinners and that. And you go there and the compare will get up at eight o'clock, introduce himself, introduce the, the top table, and he'd be using swear words right from the first sentence. And then the footballer or whoever, the guest, he'd get introduced, he'd get up and he'd be telling tales about football and addressing them, swearing and saying the F word and stuff like this. And then the comic would try and top it all at the end by swearing even more. And I didn't, I just, I got up and did it without swearing. And after, after a year or two, people actually commented on it. How do you do that without swearing? And I said, it's not necessary. Just to say that word, or that word, it's not, it, not, it doesn't enhance the gag. The gag sells itself, you know, and, uh, but it worked for me. And when people started commenting on it, I thought, oh, that'll do. And, uh, then now uh, everybody swears. You get it on the soaps, you know, pre nine o'clock they're using bad language. There isn't need for it. No, I don't have nothing against it because my language is abominable in real life. 
But, um, but not for entertainment, no. No, no. So then how long into your performing, solo performing, did you get involved with pantomime? <clears throat> I came very late to panto. I didn't... Uh, see, I was a working comic. And coming up to Christmas, just full of functions. And I could earn... I could earn more in in a night than I could do in a week panto. And, and until I actually did one, I didn't realise how much I was missing, because in, in panto you, you, you're invincible again, you're, you're mob-handed. And you still adore working with, you know, like older comics and that, because there's always dragging an old comic out to play, uh, The Dame or something like that, or, uh, I mean, some of these old blokes are wonderful. And um, I remember working, uh, working like Ted Ray, and uh, he did panto. I was in the group then, and uh, to watch somebody working like that, you know, you, 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 you couldn't buy it, an education like that, just to watch you know, an old pro working. Were you in awe? Yeah, yeah, because. Uh, Jim, Jimmy Wheeler was a, an old comic, I, I, I adored him anyway, but um, I used to talk to him and uh, he was bawdy old sod uh, in real life, but again a non-swearing theatre comic. Uh, and on the last night, he really struggled at this club in Manchester, and on the last night the MC was, he was top of the bill, and he came out and he said, well ladies and gentlemen, I've enjoyed my stay here. It's been nice working with these lads, the Cresters. Very nice boys. Very good act. He says, but I've realised one thing. I am not a club comedian. Never could be. I'm a theatre comic. I've worked all my life in theatres. I said, I don't know what it is about the clubs that I don't, I don't understand. I stand here. I don't know if it's the shape of the stage the shape of the room, but deep down in my heart, I know it's the shape of your bleeding brains. Good night. <laughs> <laughs> and what? <laughs> got standing over here. You yeah. must have had some tough gigs though back in the day when you were getting started. Oh, yeah. oh terrible. Terrible. Um, but the, but the, I try, you know, as I got older and more experienced, you tried to make sure it wasn't you, it wasn't me. It wasn't my fault they didn't like me. Sometimes you were surplus to requirements mm. and they didn't need a comedian. I mean, I did, I did one job in Harrogate and it was a corporate. And it was a, the, the closing ball on the four day conference, where it was, was a, an American theme. So everybody's dressed up like cowboys or saloon girls or Lily Bell or what, you know that and they had a barbershop quartet singing when you got there then a Dixieland band playing through the meal and then they put me on excuse me and uh, oh, just totally unnecessary for a comedian because it was altering, altering the dynamic of the room anyway the American theme was a, a, a big success. Anyway, I, I, I struggled through it and I came off. A fella came up to pay me, one of the directors. He said, uh, uh, very hard crowd for you, weren't they, yeah, young man? I said I was, no, it, was, it wasn't necessary. You didn't need a comic, it was the last thing you needed. And he said, well, we realise that, but um, I was on like 500 quid or something like that. We thought when we'd booked it, we'd booked an American comedian, Johnny Carson. I was supposed to Johnny Carson. I said, Johnny Carson, 500 pounds, so you wouldn't have, have got him on the telephone for that. <laughs> hey? He's like, he's on like three million a year on the Tonight Show. Mm. I thought we'd booked an American comedian. <laughs> What about different audiences then? Because this beautiful northern sense of humour that I've, 
I'm completely in awe of being a, a southerner. Um, we, we've got our comics down south, but there's nothing warmer than a northern comedian. Why, why do you think that is? I don't really know. Do, uh, I, I look at people who are successful now, you know, there's a lot of comedians who are very good technically, um, good workers, but they, don't be, they won't be comedy greats to me. It's only my opinion. I could be wrong, but um, they haven't got that warmth. Uh, and the, the only one that, that really had it in uh, in, in buckets was uh, Peter K. But Peter studied all the old comics anyway. But it, it, it just is likable, you know. And yet, somebody would say like Jimmy Carr was a good comic, but there's something slappable about him. <laughs> That's only it's my observation, you know, and uh, uh, it does happen a lot. You mentioned your dad was funny in the house. What about the women of the house? Well, the the, the workers they were. It was it was. Uh, I put it down to a working class upbringing, because there was all human. You know, I mean, the ladies and, that who worked worked in the mills or the factories, so a lot, a lot of them had big, big uh, sense of humour, you know, and you, and you get all, uh, if you fall off that wall and break your leg, don't come running to me, you know, all these uh, women, uh, but they had, you know, they, they were no nonsense, my mum was only four foot ten, four foot eleven, she was in business, she was a, a, a complete a master dressmaker. And she had some very expensive clients, and uh, she, I used to. I was, I was always in the room when I was a little lad. And this one lady, her husband was a garage owner in, in Halifax, and she was immaculate, beautiful woman. And the daughter went to Switzerland to finish in school. And when the lady went out there to pick her up at the end of the term, uh, she met this fella who got to pick his daughter up and uh, they fell in love and um, it turns out it was one of the De Beer family from South Africa, diamond mine owners, one of the richest families in Africa and he came to Halifax and went into the head office of the garage where her husband owned and uh, apparently he went in the office and said to him, um, me and your wife were fallen in love and we intend to be together and how much is it going to cost me and he virtually bought it as it were and they've been, they've been together ever since I thought well, that's, that's a good way to do it isn't it <laughs> uh, so they all, they all, they all said a sense of humour. My mum had about four or five sisters and a couple of brothers, you know, so they were always uh, comical. My uncle Michael used to call me JC and he was a clay miner. A tough old fella, who a tough boxing champ, you know, and uh, he said, uh, me, me, auntie, me auntie Annie and him, they went on a coach trip when he was in his late 70s, to Torquay. And they stopped in this hotel and he was a pipe smoker, a little wee guy. And there was a rugby team in, I'm doing a tour down there. And every time I went to bed, now, now then, find a bitter and a port and lemon for the wife. And uh, they started taking the mickey out of him to the <laughs> rugby team, you know. And she's saying to him, leave it. Leave it, Michael, don't. He said, no, no, it's, it's, He's, he's passed the joke, the bad man is now. He said so. She said he got up. And th these are big, young, strapping lads. He said to him, Now then, uh, Mickey Takers, who's the toughest man in your team? Who's the toughest bloke in your team? And they said, Oh no, you're all right, mate. We're only having a laugh, you know. He said, No, no, who, who's the toughest man? He said, Well, probably Jacob over there, prop forwards. About six four three. 
He said, right, I'll have you on car park now. I'll, t I'll take you out first and I'll come back for the rest of you one at a time. <laughs> and she said, no, she said, oh, they were frightened, these lads. No, yeah, no, no, no. And uh, they apologised in the end. <laughs> she, said, she said he'd have taken him out, he'd have gone out, and he'd, pull it, he'd have battered him. Did it ever feel like that when you were going out with the microphone, if there was a bit of a trying to win over a crowd? I never did that. I tried, I, it's one thing I tried to avoid that was uh, confronting a, a person or not. About, I, I, I had to many a time shut this fellow up, you know. <clears throat> Excuse me. And um, sometimes you had to. Uh, but you lose the bulk of the audience because I can hear what he's saying and they can all hear what I'm saying back to him. Mm. But uh, I, I'm not a confrontational comic. So to threaten somebody in, um, it spoils what you're trying to establish. So I avoided it. What about the, the rowdy room? Yeah, that was that was a bit different as well. Uh, um, sometimes uh, I had good a good friend who's a great comic in New York. She called Mike Kelly, and he used to get in the audience. <clears throat> good comic he was, but if they were a bit noisy, so you got a table of women, that kind party, they were the worst because they, they didn't want to listen anyway. So it, this, the one table at the front, it, it was a Christmas do. And it was a lovely room. And he gets off the stage and he goes across to these, about 12 of these smart young things. Good evening, girls. How are, how are you? Uh, all right, yeah. Nice to meet you. I'm, I'm Mike. And uh, what is this? Then? Is it a works party? Yeah, yeah. Obviously, you're not hairdressers, but um, <laughs> what, <laughs> what do you do? And he, but he rips into him like that. gently, but he, he got his point across. And in the end, uh, they all left. They all went. He went in, into the bar or somewhere. That, you know, and I thought was, that's one way. Because I've worked with comics who have. Uh, um, I worked with a comic one night and he, he, laid, he, he laid a fella out. He laid him out, what? punched him, and dragged him to the door by the back of his coat and left him there. He carried on. <laughs> I couldn't have done that. I, I, I couldn't have, oh no. But your style is quite, how can I put this, uh, slightly camp. Yeah. Where, where did that come from? Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It's it's me. I've got a daft voice. Uh, there's no point in uh, beating about the bush. I have a daft voice. I don't, I don't know. Where. I had a fellow say to me one night. I went to a, to do a reading at the BBC for a play, and uh, I, I got there in uh, the cabaret. Uh, I had to read for this play, and uh, uh, to, this fella came and filled fill the form in on one of me details of how, how old I was, how tall I was. And uh, he said to me, I um, thought it was hard at the time, he said to me, um, are, you, are you actually gay? To, to fill in for me. So I says, uh, not necessarily. <laughs> Why ask a question like that? You know, I think, I don't know, just probing or just, but you know, just, what does it matter for him? <laughs> you're funny or you're, you're funny, that's yeah. it. You're funny or you're not, that's it, isn't it? It's it should be, if it's, uh, it's a comedy party you're going for. And then you had kind of your big break on TV, didn't you? Yeah, I got to, uh, <clears throat> it was I had a couple of good news on television. The, the, the only sad part I had him was, uh, not sad, I shouldn't say that, but um, I got a couple of breaks and uh, the, they were at the wrong time in the business. There was nothing else to go on to. You know, like he'd have gone on and just said, done, I mean, the first Desi O'Connor show I did, I was on with... Uh, 
the Bee Gees. And the uh, next one I was on with Shirley MacLaine, big audiences. Uh, but there was nothing else to go on to. There were no Sunday night at the Palladium, no Hippodrome, no, there were no Saturday night shows, they'd finished them all. You'd have automatically gone from that to that to that. And uh, I did all right on most of them, but... Um, and then I did... I did, uh, I did a live show at London Palladium with... Um, Bruce Forsyth's 70th birthday party and that was fantastic and it was live and I, I remember thinking they were announcing man I mean the wings at the London Palladium going out live and I didn't feel slightly nervous I'm not a nervous sort of lad anyway but I wasn't I had no butterflies or nothing because I knew what I was doing. I'd burnt on my spot and I knew what I was doing and I had a good a good closer. And I walked on and, and I did okay. Except the fact that the MD in the orchestra it, it was going to go like that when I've got one minute to go so I could do my last gag. I'd worked it out with him. Anyway, he killed me after two minutes instead of three. So he said, if if you don't finish, he went, uh, put my finger up, within a minute, we'll play you off. So it's live, so I see his finger go up like that, and I just cut this gag off that I was in the middle of, and went to my last gag. And uh, came off, and uh, he came backstage and apologised. He, he said, I killed you too early. I said, no, he didn't. I said, but did you see how I finished? I got off on time. And it was grateful and I never, I didn't tell anybody. Because uh, I know what you can do about it now. But, but everything was like that, you know. It's, I could have gone on to that, I could have done this, I could have done that. Um, but, you keep going. I didn't, I, I did some extra work once. I used to do a bit of extra work. Not a lot, but, um, with uh, Last of the Summer Wine. I was compost standing for uh, action scenes. And sadly, I looked like him. <laughs> and uh, I look like him now, I know. And he, uh, it was good, but uh, th there were loads of old pros in the crowd scenes, mm. old club comics that I, knew, I used to know. And it was fantastic to see that they were still pitching, still doing something in the business. Cause it's, it's not a business you can give up, is it? I mean, uh, I mean, the, 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 I, did, I did one big panto part, which was Jim Davison's, one of his productions. I'd not worked with him at the time, and uh, a big star, Jim, and uh, uh, he set me up terribly. He said, uh, it was Cinderella, and uh, it was Stoke on Trent, and uh, um, who was in it? Mr. Blobby was in it, who on stage was phenomenal. Kids adored it. And the, fa the, the fairy was um, um, uh, young lady of Heidi Eye. Um, Sue Pollard? No, other one. Ruth Maddock? Ruth Maddock. Ruth, and she was terrific in it. But she had to follow down Mr. Blobby in the walk down at the end. And at the end, the kids went berserk for Mr. Blobby. And she come down and her face set in stone. <laughs> <laughs> it was it, a terrific writer with Jim Davison. And it'd it tear three or four pages out of scripts when you're rehearsing it. Nah, that ain't working. Psh, tear it out and sh this to rewrite something else. But he could do it, he had the brain, you know. You ever been tempted to get behind the scenes and start writing? Uh, not really, no, I've always... I, I, could, I could write for myself. Uh, and I, I, I've always had a good... I know it's funny. I think I know it's funny. I, but I know it's funny for me. I know I can get a laugh. I mean, I, I hear gags 
I'm going to say all the time it's a currency, isn't it? But I've, I've cried laughing at comedians, you know, like proper funny men like Norman Collier and, uh, and uh, Neville King, the ventriloquist. Cried laughing at them. I used to follow them around like a poodle when we were working to, we worked in uh, Oman and uh, uh, Dubai and uh, Neville, it's it better be got all, he'd full combat gear on, desert combat gear he got from somewhere. <laughs> Tea towel on his head, full <laughs> Arab gear. And we're out on, uh, going over the sand in a jeep. We come to this oasis and uh, there's, a, there's a, a water pool and palm trees and three Arab lads. Uh, we didn't. We stopped the jeep and got up and uh, then the smoking pot and I got a little clay pipe. And this lad and he uh, never gets out. And he's got Sherlock Holmes pipe, uh, <laughs> big thing. <laughs> now then, lads, um, you all right? You having a smoke, lad? He says, yeah, yeah, you know. Neville says, here, you can have some of my back here and I'll have some of yours. <laughs> he, he gives him this pouch with St. Bruno in it or something like that. <laughs> he said, give us yours then. It's like a little pouch out like that. He's got some hash in it like that. <laughs> and he said, uh, can I have a, a fill? <laughs> oh, no, no, no. <laughs> but it, it, does he speak English? And uh, Neville had a go on his, on his hash pipe. And they went, woo, and did a, a somersault and ran up, ran up up a, up a, up a palm tree. <laughs> he says, that's good stuff, lad, youth, he says to him. But they, they, they had him, he had him just, he just make, couldn't make him laugh. And Norman, we were on a, on a fish market, and they were selling like live turtle and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, um, I love a, a piece of piece of turtle and box turtle on head and oh, I cut it out and, and and then the one next to it had been selling fish there and it was just covered in blue bottles. There's no fish left. Just covered in blue bottles. This table, a seething mass of blue bottles, and an old fella sat at the end, no teeth. And uh, Neville says to him. How much are your blue bottles, lad? <laughs> <laughs> this old fella said, uh -huh. how, how much a pound are there? <laughs> <laughs> Two pound of blue bottles. <laughs> but in the end, they were, they were laughing. He had them laughing. Then he does, as a ventriloquist, he's doing talking belly button. Open, oh, pull his shirt up. And he's, the voice is coming from his belly button. And it was like, Voodoo to these lads, though. And then they started laughing. And in the end, he, he, he dropped his pants and said uh, goodbye with his backside. <laughs> uh, howling. You must have made so many friends over the years, though, in the comedy scene. Oh, just. And, and they don't alter. Had a, uh, had a phone call this week from uh, Bernie Clifton. He was 85 last week, bright as a button, absolutely bright as a button, and he just never stops. He, he rings you, he, he's always, he says to me, uh, uh, I told him I'd broken my ankle, and he sent me a letter the day after, saying I hope he'd be better soon, he said, uh, um, are you still using them tap shoes I sent you? <laughs> Just relentless. And you've lost a few as well, haven't you? Some of the yeah. absolute classics. Yeah, I went to, went to a few funerals. Uh, I went to, went to Bernard Manning's, and that was, a, that was a good one. Bernard Manning, and he, he had a, f um, he had a, a hearse and, Four horses pulling the hearse, which a black hearse, glass sided, and the coffin in the back. And um, Frank Carson gets up. Um, he followed this fellow who's 
used to sing Abide With Me at the Cup Final every year, Rugby Cup Final. Uh, he used to sing that and he got up and sang that to Bernard's coffin. And then uh, Frank Carson gets up and Frank says, There you go, Vince Miller, abide with me. Now you know why I don't work anymore. <laughs> And uh, he said, my, my dear friend Bernard, he said, he said, I haven't known each other over 50 years. Never had a wrong word. Good man. Been accused of being racist. He's not racist. He's got four black horses pulling his coffin. <laughs> no, no racism there in, in him at all. Good man. He said, I saw him last week in hospital and he wasn't very well. And he said, uh, if I don't get out of here alive, Frank, tell that thief, Chubby Brown, he can have the rest of me out. <laughs> <laughs> so were you ever tempted to go down the blue route? No, no, I didn't. It, it, it didn't suit me. Uh, it didn't suit me, me, me style anyway. I mean, I'd, I'd do gags, I, I still do an odd gag with a swear word, and it's essential mm. to the gag, otherwise uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't work. But um, people swear for no no reason. Uh, it, it doesn't embellish a gag. I, 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 get, I work with lads and uh, young lads and they're swearing, and they don't know how to swear properly. You know what I mean? They don't. They just, they, they just put that word in there. It doesn't do anything. It doesn't make you look a bigger man and all like that. Have you always been very critical of your act then? <laughs> Not really, no. I just do it. Just get on and do it. You know, I've got friends who were. Uh, uh, one of my favourite comics is a lad called Adrian Walsh. Terrific comic, real student of comedy, and uh, he used to do it when he was on cruise ships. He, he, he wore a microphone on his tie, and he'd tape every performance and listen, listen, listen to it. And uh, I don't know if I could do that. I don't like listening to myself when I don't tell it. It's off on me. But we were all like that. Too. I was watching. Des O'Connor one night, and I stood in the doorway of the, the lounge, till he's on there, and I stood there on my own. My daughter's on the settee, my youngest one's got a dressing gown over her head, and she's got Smith to a book now. <laughs> and then my, uh, my mother, poor old thing, she had dementia for 10 years, my mum, and she knew me right to the last day, didn't know anybody else. And she knew me. And uh, I was doing a show in Life House with the Grumbleweeds, a charity night. And uh, they brought us, she sat in the front row, middle middle aisle, front row seat, her and two nurses, right in the front row. Because I come on and it's, it's my hometown, so I'm doing all right, I'm getting big laughs and that. But every time it went quiet and I was setting the next gag up, all I can hear is my mother going, Look at silly bugger. <laughs> hey, look at silly bugger. No, no. And like, I couldn't handle it. I had to, go, I had to walk down to the other end of the stage to finish my act up. Because you're heckling me. Where did the... Uh, whereabouts did the mixing up of words come from? I'd, um, I, did, I, actually, that, I actually got the, I, I got the idea from one of my mother's clients. Um, this family were mill owners, but the mother was a very ordinary lady, and they were the mill owners, and they owned three or four mills, and they were a very rich family. So by now, he's got a chauffeur-driven car for his mum, and she used to shop at Harrods in the West End, and she was one of these, she was quite an old lady, and she was, she was on do bunny from ten o'clock in the morning. Uh, but 
he, he used to get it a lot in them days. Uh, people used to talk about their education, which I've always found hilarious. <laughs> used to get them at working men's clubs, chairman, trying to talk posh. And uh, anyway, uh, she came this one, one morning and she'd been, uh, oh, uh, my son, Gerald, he took me to uh, London last weekend, Mrs. Cassin. And uh, I, I, he bought me lots of lovely things. And she said, and you paid for this. Be I'd like you to make me a suit. And I said, and she said he bought me this. We went to the um, uh, Chanel shop. And he bought me this, under his past. He bought me this beautiful Tamiriel. And I were, I were reading a comic. And uh, my mum said, material. Yes, this material, it's from Chanel. And I've gone, I've run a set to you now, I've gone laughing. <laughs> and uh, I've used it ever since. But I, I started, then I started doing my own. And, uh, and then I heard Hilda Baker, she used to do it. And uh, mix her words up. And uh, I had a big vocabulary at one time, but. Um, I just do it now, with ladies and gentlemen, and uh, I've got about fifty of them. Yeah, old ladies and growbacks. Yeah, ladies and growbacks. Yeah. I had to, uh, but like, you, um, people try and nick them off you. Well, a lot of them do, uh, and it doesn't really work. Because they put the emphasis in the wrong place, you know. Hmm. And, uh, yeah, I'll have to start remembering them again when I get working. We were just talking before we started recording, weren't we, about yeah. that you're going to be going on tour very soon with Tommy Cannon, Stu Francis, yeah. and yourself. And you said you haven't performed in a year. I haven't really, no, I just, I went to a garden party. Uh, when it was nice weather a few, a few months ago and the fellow said we've got a girl singer on will you introduce her I said of course I will I stuck a mic in my hand and I didn't know what to say <laughs> <laughs> I stood there like a bloody cucumber <laughs> and I, I went uh, hiya like, uh, I couldn't think uh, oh I'd done it before I, I did it um, when I had a, a long time off work I had about five weeks off. Uh, I fell down the steps here at home, going upstairs, and I stumbled. So, so I went like that. So I grabbed for the handrail, missed it, and fell down six steps backwards here. And uh, I couldn't move. I was conscious, but I, I knew I'd done something to me. And yeah, Marie's playing. Back coming. She's number one in this American league, she's dynamite. And she is fatty fall, so she's come flying out and said, What have you done? I said, I fall and said, I can't can you help me up? I can't move. So she helped me up and uh, my neck was going out. Oh. So I should get used to get me an ambulance. Got me an ambulance, took me to A and E. Uh, and they they X rayed my neck. And two doctors came with the x-ray and they sent me home with a box of paracetamol and a, a lethal how to massage your stiff neck and I, I, I got home and I was in agony and I said no I can't I'll have to go anyway I went back again about two hours later and there was a neurosurgeon on duty and he scanned it and he said you've broken your neck My fractured See, cervical one, cervical two, top two vertebrae on your, in, in your neck. And they've just given you a paracetamol. And they said if you'd have massaged your neck, you'd have been in a wheelchair forever. God, I was lucky. Anyway, I'd had six weeks off work and uh, I got back to work. And I had to go for a photo shoot because we were doing a, a big show in Manchester. 
went to this uh, hospice to have um, some photos and they had all weeping willow trees and that beautiful I have some pictures taken for the posters and that and uh, when we finished the, the matron was there and she said would you like to have a look around the hospice and Johnny I said I'd, yeah I'd be very honoured to so we go in and bear in mind I'd not been in hospice at this point in my life and then we went to this room and it was uh, people on respite care that were away from home for a, an afternoon mm. and they were getting treatment on, in their arms and that, about 12 or 15 people all terminally ill and the matron went ladies and gentlemen this is Johnny Casson he's a very well known comedian and I'm sure if we ask him now he'll tell us a few jokes and I, I went I, I, I was freaked out of sight and I went uh, I, just, I, I just didn't know what to say I went oh yeah uh, and the nurse is little doing something in a fella's arm here and I said to her uh, are you looking for an older man love she said not that bloody old <laughs> well they all laughed everybody laughed and uh, I relaxed first gag that came into my mind to tell I said to my wife the other day what's going to happen to you when I'm dead that's my gag and the answer is well with a bit of luck I'll be acquitted <laughs> which is a funny gag but like not what you're telling them not the hospice, hospice. <laughs> anyway they laugh like laugh like hell so I just did a few of my gags and she, when I came off, the matron said to me, you did exactly the, the right thing. I said, what was that? I said, I was, I was stunned when you asked me to tell a few jokes. I said, and uh, she said, no, but you, to us, there's no conditions dying. They're either alive or they're dead. And that's exactly what you did right. Don't patronise them by trying to avoid stuff that might be offensive and uh, that kind of attitude which is, is right but uh, she said that's, that's just how we treat everybody yeah. he did exactly the right thing I thought I couldn't cry for that <laughs> what about travelling around the world then because you mentioned Oman and Dubai yeah the mostly English speaking people um, although I, I went I went to a I worked at a, a a country club in uh, Dubai, and they're all um, all British people uh, that go to the club. So de dead smart, but they have a games room and it was full of Arabs. And uh, uh, some have been in robes and that, but uh, uh, they were they were okay. They were they, at night time. They were there at lunchtime. One of them and. Uh, this one who I got talking to spoke very good English. He said, um, uh, I, have a, I have a house in Windsor, I live, I, 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 in England. We go to a big club in Windsor called Blazers. I said, I know it, I've been there. He said, we go to see this very famous comedian. Everybody laughing, screaming laughing. I couldn't understand one word he said. I said, what was his name? He said, Frank Carson. <laughs> <laughs> I said, we don't understand him either. <laughs> he said, uh, but everybody laughing. Low laugh, laugh, laugh. Anyway, when I get on stage at night, um, he's sat up front. He's been in since lunchtime. And uh, the, the lad who booked me said to the barman, what's uh, such a body drinking today? He said, uh, uh, cans, Heineken export. He said he'll have had at least 30 since lunchtime. 30 cans of export, small cans. And driving home, they drive home as well, over the desert. They don't get stopped. They've got a, a Dubai number plate, you see. Police don't stop their own. Uh, Anyway, he says, I've done about 20 minutes, I'm doing all right. He says, uh, 
Johnny, Johnny, said, what had he said, uh, can I tell a joke? <laughs> Fucking hell, did we? I said, is it a short joke? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He said, where would you find an Irish motor mechanic? I said, I don't know. He said, lying under a wheelbarrow. <laughs> I'm, like, <laughs> I'm quite good. And he had him telling me an Irish joke. And uh, I got him a round of applause. And, uh, but other than that, uh, mostly people are they're all expats, you know. I heard that you got up during a talent contest or something, wasn't it, back in the day? I started, yeah, I did, yeah, I started doing comedy. And I went to Woodlands on holiday. Hmm. And uh, we went in to watch the auditions for the talent contest. So, my wife said, why don't you get up and do a bit? I said, that'd be ridiculous. I said, I'm a really professional artiste, don't get up in here, isn't it? And he said, oh, you don't, get, you don't get up without your group, dare you? Oh, that was it. You don't dare me. So I got up and I did it. But anyway, I did it. Uh, I won the week on a Friday, I think it was. And I won the... I got back to the semi-final there. So I won a week's holiday for the family and do the semi-finals at Minehead. Gets to Minehead. There's only one... I was the only comic on the bill. They were all singers. And uh, I won that and I got to the final at uh, London Palladium. And uh, they had a junior contest. Uh, then the senior contest, then they had an interval, then they had a cabaret, um, Keith Harris and uh, Joe Longfellow. And then they, they gave out the results. And I won, I won, I won the bloody talent contest. I won the big cup, won the cup, won the cup that big, and five thousand pound. Which for then would have been. It, it was eight, 1983. It was a nice pickup. It was. I, I, I haven't got any left of it, but um, I've still got the cup because uh, they got taken over by top rank. They did bookings, and they never asked for the cup back, so I've still got that. <laughs> And did that change you much, your confidence with the comedy? Well, it made, it made me realise I could do it. I'd, I'd, I'd actually worked once on my own, which was a, a, a gay bar in Huddersfield. It was called... Um, oh, fantastic. Uh, they, had a, they had comics on every night. And, uh, and then they did this... Um, this, when they closed the bar and the bar was cleared they put a show on the bar uh, drag acts uh, and they did this they had an iconic song called We're Having a Gang Bang and all the crowd used to do it you know mm. but we were a successful business and it spawned a, a load of uh, gay bars in Yorkshire bloody loads of them and uh, um, so I I'd, I'd actually done a spot there. There were a hetero audience, but it was run by gays and the, the show were gays. And, uh, but I realised I could work on my own then. And I used to work with my drum kit and open and close with a drum solo. But then I realised it was just self indulgent. And, uh, you know, it didn't work. It's cheating a bit. It's a lot to lug around, isn't it? It is when you've done it all your bloody life. <laughs> you know? And like, there's only me. There's nobody to help me. The old bag. No, no, not not her. Oh no, not that one. No, no, the the bag that you like to bring on. My trolley. Your trolley bag. Yeah. Yeah. Can I ask? Why? <laughs> uh, because I've heard rumours that there's there's some notes written on top of it as well. Oh, but I certainly I certainly use the top for uh, for notes. Yeah, it's a great way of uh, 
breaking new material in. Hmm. And people don't notice. <laughs> don't matter whether they do or not. It's only me can read it. <laughs> but I did. Um, I used to I used to work with quite a lot of props, and uh, I've got two or three things that I get out of it now, but not not as many as I used to. But it became a it became a bit of a trademark. I had a I used to carry a bag on with props in anyway, but it, it looked untidy on a chair and that. And it was a pal of mine, he said, get you on to get a Dorothy bag like my cleaning woman. And so it's, and he showed me. And it's, it's called a granny bag because it's smaller than uh, a normal shopping trolley. And you could only get them in Blackpool in the market and uh, can't get them there anymore. But people said to me, what, what? What have, you, what have you got in your bag? You, you don't do what with it, do you? I says, uh, yeah. What do you do? I said, bring it up with me. I take it up with me. <coughs> What's in it? I said, no, it's not your business. <laughs> I said, get your own bloody act. Put what you want in it. <laughs> I put my phone in it and I put my wallet in it. Because uh, you don't want them nicking out of dress, you know. Anything valuable. It's iconic for you, though. It, 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 after it sounds, it is. Is it daftness? I mean, do you still like daft comedy? What do you find yourself watching these days? Oh, I, 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 I do. I, I've been watching... Um, at, n at night time, I, I watched this thing on, on Sky, I think it is. Smithsonian Channel, it's called. And the Smithsonian is the... National Museum of America, and uh, <clears throat> they do fantastic uh, aerial uh, viewing things, aerial Britain, and they go all over Britain now, and America, India, and all the pictures are taken above ground level. Phenomenal it is, and, and commentary. And uh, uh, they're the, the also uh, nearby on, on the sky thing is. Uh, uh, a documentary channel and I've been watching the the history of comedy I've been watching a bit today and it showed you these uh, it was all about um, animated comedy today you know the Smith uh, what they call them uh, Simpsons and all stuff. and some of them are very very rude extremely rude but they get away with it because and and quite uh, on PC content but they, when they're being animated, they get away with it. But some of these people that are famous for doing the voice on, say, this thing or that thing, uh, one of them had had like 90 million views on eBay. And he said, how do you, how do you get that into your mind? 90 million views of me doing the voice for someone else, like nobody knows him. And, uh, but some of these things have got enormous. And like this, this um, they're doing this um, Star Wars film that Jack Hughes, that's a mother, that goes in, that just came out of that room. She's, uh, she was married to Anne Marie's husband, Eric. She was his first wife. She's 87 now. And uh, the divorce, and when Eric met Amory and they got married. Well, the daughter owns this pub at Cleveland, and uh, the filming this week at uh, Star Wars on the promenade at Cleveland. Uh, and so they had to close part of the prom down. And there's some right, they spent a lot of money on the promenade up there, so a lot of dough. And the Mac is it's Netflix. Disney Channel, and they're making this Star Wars, and she, she went up at seven o'clock this morning, and the whole of her restaurant's full of uh, um, them dressing white. No, stormtroopers. Stormtroopers. A room full I've of never seen it. <laughs> I've never seen it. But she said they came on buses from other hotels, fully dressed, but with blankets on them, blankets over their heads, so paparazzi can't take any. 
that you should get a thousand out of that. Crazy, isn't it? Nothing's strange. But that that's it's going to be the way forward for ent entertainment. You know, um, podcasting stuff and, and broadcasting on, on the internet. Because the younger people want that anyway. They only want to watch things they watch. They don't want to sit and watch some old-fashioned variety show with a... Yeah, they do. A, a lot of the young ones don't. They don't understand it. Well, that's what pantomime is, though, really. It's a, oh. it's a two-hour-long variety <coughs> show with a story. Um, yeah, it is. I'm not, I'm not saying they wouldn't enjoy it. A fellow said to me one night, a young lad, I took it as a compliment. He come up, he said that he'd never seen a comic. He'd not, never seen a comic live like me. Uh, uh, he said to me, Hey man, that was seriously funny, man. And I thought, what a lovely phrase that. Seriously funny. And I said, he said, I never seen that. Have. He's only ever been to comedy clubs. He'd never seen a proper comic working. And um, they can't concentrate the same. And I think it's for doing all that. And mm. I mean, they talk to the rubber tables now, you know, texting each other. Like from each other. And he's going, <laughs> Would you like to go into a comedy club? One of the new cool comedy clubs. I've actually I've done one. I did uh, I did the, co the comedy club in uh, Manchester with uh, Mick Miller. Mick Miller uh, and a lad called uh, Morehouse. Justin Morehouse. Justin, yeah, Manchester n new comic, <laughs> and uh, uh, it was a older audience because they had ad advertised Mick, Mick Miller and me so we had an older audience in but it was a good mixed audience and uh, <coughs> I went on first Mick, Mick started the night off I gone did 20 minutes just in 20 minutes interval and then Mick Miller and uh, they were good pretty terrific audience and they were listened properly they could get drinks, but they were brought in. They didn't have a bar, you know. There were no distractions. Good room to work. And, uh, this uh, there was one party in down here. Uh, a bit rowdy. They, they came in for a meal, Christmas too, and they didn't. They didn't know what was going on, so they sat there watching. Anyway, I just done my, I've got my check jacket on. And I do. I, I do a few gags about it, and. Uh, I'd done all that. And this fellow went, I like your jacket, where do you get that? On this table. I said, uh, <coughs> I've just I've just explained 10 minutes about my jacket. Were you not listening? No, I like your jacket, where do you get that? That is a drink. So I, uh, I I get, I, I, I hit him with somewhat facetious and, uh, Everybody clapped around him, you know, and uh, he said, uh, oh, the fella came down, Dorman, and said, you know, no, no, I cleaned him. You know. And yeah, I, I, I ignored him and just carried on. Did me only come off. Justin Morehouse came on. And he said, uh, this fella shouts out, Oi, fatty, I've had your mother. He said, what? He said, I've had your mother. Well, he gave him a tirade. I mean, I don't like it. <laughs> the language was abominable. <laughs> but he shut up. <laughs> you know, real heavy words. And uh, next thing I know, the two big doormen came in, accompanied him out of the room. Just lifted him. I thought, oh, that's good. You could have done with that in the old days of the uh, working men's clubs. Yeah, they were chucking him in when I was. <laughs> well, Chubby's always had uh, Chubby, and uh, he's managed by a, a Blackpool lad, uh, Tony Joe. I don't know if you've heard of Tony Joe. He's a comic, and he was in uh, 
it was in the uh, Grumbleweeds. It used to be the, the roadie to the Grumbleweeds, going back to 30 years. And uh, <coughs> it was a comic, and it ended up joining uh, Robin, Robin Graham and Tony Joe, three of them. And because uh, Morris had left and gone solo, and uh, the other one was doing clubs on his own, the singer. So they just r Robin and, uh, and Graham. And then if they had a big gig, they used to get Tony Joe. Because then that gave him time to get changed. Tony Joe was a very strong comic. About six foot four, six foot five. But very aggressive. Do you wish you'd done more panto then? Yeah, I should have done. No, I should have done. Um, it was um, it was partly my agent's fault because it was uh, I worth more money to him doing one nighters, <laughs> one night crucifixions, Christmas party, <laughs> worth a lot more money to him than uh, very short sighted thinking about it. <coughs> It's there for life. It, it, it was a job for life. Mm. I mean, a bit like a bit. Billy Pierce has just made a living out of Bradford. A good living. Do you go and see many? I, I have done over the years, you know. No, no. When my kids were little, I used to take them. <coughs> and uh, I've taken, I took them to see Billy a couple of times. I took them to see uh, Billy when he, was, he had... Um, he had Sooty, Sooty on, on the show. And I took him back, to, took me, me, oh, my grandkid, took him backstage, and uh, Sooty were there with, with box and everything. And he was that frightened, he didn't look up. Kind of like a little <laughs> shy kid, but yeah, he's done well. That lad, uh, I, I did panto with him at Halifax, him at Scott Sooty. He's a magician. Richard Cadell. Richard. He's a, he, he was a good act. <coughs> he used to disappear in motorbike and everything, you know, but good in panto, you know. He was a guest on Christmas. Was he? For me, yeah. yeah. We had him and Sweep sung the theme song at the end, oh, the other side. Fantastic. So, so he's in good hands with him, pardon the pun. Oh. <sighs> He knows what, uh, well he knows the business I think he's, a, um, he's from show people anyway I think. Mm. He always had a few above anyway. Yeah. One thing I would love to have seen you do is Dame. I nearly, nearly did it. I should have done it. Um, Not too late. I did, I did it once but it was, it was in there. Uh, and that was Snow White, and I played Dame Donut, and um, oh, terrific! I really enjoyed it. But um, it was um, Freddie, Freddie, Freddie and the Dreamers. He was in it. Um, Snow White was uh, Letitia Dean. Good. Uh, Nasty old uh, mother, she was a good, good actress, and it was, it was most enjoyable. And I had to sing, can't sing, but I had to. I'm Dame Donut, and I had to one, and I was throwing donuts out to the crowd. Uh, but they were, uh, they were kept in the freezer for the whole run, and I had to get them out for the evening performance. But when we were in Matinee, I was throwing them out, and they were still freaking frozen. <laughs> Anyway, I hit somebody on the head, <laughs> and uh, they won't let me do it after that. Ah. Spark sports. <laughs> but you enjoyed the experience of being a dame? I, do you know what I like best about it? When you come out of the stage door, and we're going for a drink after, nobody knew me. Because <laughs> it never we going to go straight out. <laughs> yeah, it was, it, it was a good theatre, and I was at Stockport. <coughs> um, and the dwarfs, oh, 
one little album was on it, 32 inches, you know. and they were knocking on a bit, it was 60. And he, he drank Red Rock cider from lunchtime till they went to bed. Hardly ate. And it was hilarious on stage. No, I, rec- I reckon you'd, uh, you could don the frock. I think you could have a bit of fun. Oh, I could do. I could. I could do a dame, definitely. Not too I, physical. I, they, I'm sure they'd uh, they'd look after you. Yeah. Move your feet a little bit. Everybody else dances. What were you like as a dancer, anyway? Oh, <laughs> word, word perfect. <laughs> Better than the singing. Would you? And then they said, uh, first panto I did where I, I, I sang dame doing it all right. Then my next panto was at Halifax. And uh, I don't know, wishy washy, I think it was. And I had to sing. Do you want to be in my gang, my gang, my gang? <laughs> Gary Glitter. And I had to run down the stairs, under the stage, and make my entrance at the other side, uh, singing, Do you want to be in my gang? And uh, when first first rehearsal in the theatre, I, I couldn't get my breath. No, I'm just mad again. And we uh, can't hear the words, John. Oh, no. <laughs> it was hard work. But, uh, bloody good fun. Did you enjoy the camaraderie? Yeah, the it was. I used to call it matinees, and I'd been out on the juice the night before. And I used to come on and say to him, now. I had a really good entrance. All the lights went out and there was like searchlights going all over the theatre like that. And uh, and when the house lights went up it was me in a shopping trolley with two torches strapped to the side so <laughs> it was a great entrance. <laughs> and they got me out of the trolley and uh, I was sort of still half cut from the night before, you know. And <laughs> now then, uh, boys and girls, my name's Wishy Washy, and uh, Wishy Washy had a long meeting last night with Mr. Carlsberg, <laughs> and he didn't feel very well today. <laughs> and uh, so don't make a lot of noise, will you? Really. <laughs> very funny. But I don't attack. Um, yeah, I came to it late, and I've always regretted it. You know, getting other uh, we had we had somebody came to review hours at uh, Stockport, uh, and it was from uh, that magazine, Time Out, something like that. One of these modern magazines who detested pantomime, and they sent this woman to review it, and. Uh, and the, and the uh, embarrassing sight of uh, uh, wishy-washy um, getting the children to wiggle the bottom in the song sheet at the end. You know, what, and I, oh no, I was dame doing and I had, when they lifted my skirt up to, to, to waggle your bum, I had two handprints on my ass, like that black handprint, you know. Uh, getting the kids to waggle the bottom and it was the best part of Panto kids adored it she says uh, um, did, did, uh, when, when we came off on the opening night I said did you did you enjoy it Ruth whatever they called and she said uh, no no I don't, I don't particularly like Panto anyway but uh, it's very old fashioned enough I find it quite demeaning to the children. The song sheet. Which put it all in bloody critique. <laughs> did, did, did rather, he did um, give him tra- transgender lessons and, <laughs> you know. What do reviewers know, that's the thing. Uh, 
Well, they always know better, don't they? You know, they... Who writes your material? I do it myself. How do you do it? I say, well, I know, I know what's funny. I don't write it all myself. A lot of stuff I react to. Yeah, hear, hear, hear a story and <clears throat> that's funny. I could, I could work that into a routine or a, the basis of a routine. So then what happens is you do that and you build a gag up. I've always tried to build a gag up um, so that you're not relying on the punchline. So you're getting laugh, laugh, laugh through the gag. You're building on it and the, the punch kind, punchline is going to be good. And then you get somebody on who nick two or three lines off you and they spoil the whole routine if you don't know them. Mm. You build up to that and they just nick bits of it, you know, and uh, oh, I've always done that. No, you haven't. You're using the same word in that I used when I wrote it. You know, you haven't altered a line in that or a, a letter. <laughs> oh, I haven't done it for years. I said, well, you nicked it years ago then. <laughs> What have been your most favourite gags or the ones you're most proud of? Um, God, I don't know. Difficult one is that because I can't remember what I did last year. <laughs> well, shall I tell you one of my favourite ones? Go on. The one about the miners. I mean, that's really of its time, isn't it? But the one about there's been reports about stealing. Oh, stealing the pitch. Oh. Love that. Great gag. Beautiful. Don't. Don't walk down. Yeah, go on. <laughs> Take the coffee. Go on, it still gets a good laugh, though. It's amazing. It's a good gag. Real good old northern... Good old northern humour. And, and we can't lose this sort of thing, and that's kind of... You're, you're still sharing the magic on YouTube, that's the thing. Yeah, yeah, they, they won't die. Uh, they don't... There's that frightened of offending people, uh, uh, modern days. The, the, there's a good gags there that you can still do without being offensive. Mm. Well, this leads me on to my last question for you. Right. Okay. It's your dream pantomime. So you can be in it, you can be in the stalls watching it, you can choose the production, the theatre, and the cast can be alive or dead or a mixture of both. Right. Um, if, ideally, it would be the, the Grand Theatre in Blackpool. Would be an ideal venue. Most perfect um, variety theatre. Um, I'd like to be in it. Playing a juvenile lead. <laughs> no, I, I, I did enjoy Wishy Washy, was probably my favourite part. Enjoyed that enormously. I'd love to have been in it with uh, Norman Collier. Oh, my God, you're never looking. Anita Harris. Um, on a good top of the bill, though. See, Roy Hood would have made it. Bloody terrific day, me did do. Be a great widow, Twanky, wouldn't they? Oh, fantastic. But I, I saw him in a, a play it's called uh, Sally Gold Cadillac or something in the West End. Uh, it's an American <coughs> comedy. And, and, uh, uh, it, it played me, Mrs. Bouquet. She was a star. Um, I can't think of her name. Um, 
Rup, Rutledge was it? Rup? Oh, Patricia Routledge. Patricia Routledge. And uh, but Roy wiped the bloody floor with them all because of his delivery. She got the, the television voice he had, just too quiet. And he's got comics delivery and performers with the um, projection. Oh, it was bloody awesome, it was on stage. Uh, so he, he'd have to be damned, definitely. And what would be your bar to drink afterwards? <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, Like, uh, yeah, I don't know really. I like, I like the Grand Bar. Also, like the Water Rats Bar. It's a bit of a long way to go every night. Mm. <coughs> <coughs> that, that sounds like a fun panto. Be alright, that, yeah. I think it's only me alive. You get all the ticket money. I'm not feeling no. <laughs> not feeling so good myself. <laughs> Don't say that. <laughs> that first time then you appeared on the stage at the Palladium <coughs> with the Butlins. Yeah. Well, from the Butlins competition. What was that like? Knowing obviously the history of the Palladium and everything oh. else. For me it's a I feel a nut. Uh, I, I was talking to a couple of them new comics backstage and like I'm backstage at Palladium in the afternoon and I'm grinning like, like a fucking idiot to myself fucking London Palladium <laughs> things there da, da. Uh, and I'm, 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 I couldn't really believe it and uh, I saw this lad come round who had work with called Sean Mayo he's a new comic and uh, not bad. That's a few tellers and that. So I said to him, "Are you are you on the show, Sean?" He says, "No, no, no, I'm not, Johnny." He said, uh, "They offered it me, but the, they offered me uh, six minutes, which they were going to cut down to four. He said, "But I'm not having anybody touching my material." I said to him, "Kill old Sean, look where you are." Said, "Can't you feel the ghost here?" Kill old Leonard, Bobo, Frank Sinatra, Judy Garland, Danny Kay, can't you? Can't you feel all that? He went, he didn't know what I meant. And I thought, how sad is that? They actually think they've invented comedy, you know, their, their comedy. I said, actually, it's a bit like that. And it was nicely tatty backstage, which I like. I, Adored even more. Strictly no smoking, because Diana Ross was one of the top of the bills, and she's so anti-smoking. You couldn't smoke in the yard outside. It's a television show, and the lads like to have a tablet in camera breaks and that. Mm. Oh no, they banned all that. <coughs> she had four people outside the dressing room, gophers. So I went to her and I said, "Are you?" Uh, Professional smoking inhalers. <laughs> he went, be gone. <laughs> what have been your favourite venues to play then? Theatres or even working men's clubs? Uh, I, I, I love working men's clubs. Uh, my favourite one, uh, I used to love doing uh, Leighton Institute in Blackpool. Brilliant venue. Um, Battle Variety Club was just amazing. Great place to work. London Palladium, magnificent. London Palladium and the Grand were built by the same fella, Frank Matcham. Matcham Theatres are always tremendous. And, uh, We enjoyed working them. Well, Johnny, thank you so much for taking part in the Panto podcast. It's been a, a joy. I 
I've forgotten how long I've been in the business. <laughs> Thanks, mate. Yeah, thank you very much. Then better talk.